Imagine being asked to design a car that can drive like a race car, go off-road like an SUV, and is as luxurious as a limousine, all while being as affordable as a compact sedan. It's almost an impossible task, right? Similarly, the F-35 Lightning was expected to meet a diverse set of requirements that were sometimes at odds with each other, and still be affordable. That was the plan for the Lightning, yet now it's going to cost $1.7 trillion. So how do we get here? And is this do-everything fighter worth the money? Let's take a look at how the F-35 program dealt with an ever-growing set of requirements, how three airframes were designed to fit virtually every mission, why the software code has always been an issue, why things are running hot with the engine, and where all the money went. To understand the full impact of the F-35 program, we'll need to get some perspective as to how much $1.7 trillion is. For starters, if you stacked $1.7 trillion $1 bills, the stack would be approximately 115,380 miles high, which is about halfway to the moon. If you place the same $1 bills end to end, it would measure 164,760,227 miles, or enough to go around the Earth 6,615 times. $1.7 trillion is like stacking the Great Pyramid with gold bricks. But these dollars won't be used for stacking contests or pyramid building, but rather to purchase, maintain, train pilots, crews, and all the associated costs for the F-35. We'll get back to the dollar figures later, but again, is this fighter worth the cost? Ironically, the F-35's goal was to save money. To really understand what the F-35 has set out to do, you have to go all the way back to the 90s. You couldn't get away from purple and teal colors, and more importantly, the Soviet Union had collapsed ending the Cold War, and the first Gulf War had ended in a resounding victory for the US and the West. The thinking at the time was that since the Cold War was over, it was time to pay the peace dividend. Military budgets were cut, and as a result, the Pentagon wanted to develop a cheaper and more versatile fighter. From this came the F-35, which began its life as the Joint Strike Fighter or JSF program. The program's objective was to build a single airplane that would be stealthy, lightweight, easy to fly, and that could be slightly modified to work for the Navy, Air Force, and Marines. Think of a single car chassis that can be adapted for different models. A good example of this in the car world is Volkswagen's MQB approach, which standardizes many components while allowing for variability in wheelbase, track, and external dimensions. Cars from the VW Golf to the Audi TT are produced using this methodology. Getting back to the JSF program, by the time the requirements were finalized, you had to develop a single family of aircraft that could fly supersonic like an F-16 Viper, sneak past defenses like an F-117 Nighthawk, hover like an AV-8 Harrier, and land on carriers like an F-18 Super Hornet. Consider a family of three siblings, a city dweller, a sailor, and a mountain climber. If they all went shopping for shoes, they'd each need something different. City shoes, boat shoes, and climbing boots. Now, instead of buying three different pairs, imagine if their parents tried to design one shoe to fit all these purposes. That's akin to the challenge faced in designing three variations of the F-35 for very different military environments. These requirements on paper seemed wonderful. With one aircraft family that could perform all of these missions, you'd save money on pilot training, maintenance, while having a pool of common parts that could be sourced and readily available. With so many eggs in the F-35's basket, the stakes had quickly ballooned. On top of this, the JSF program is going to be made available to allies who would also share in the development and manufacturing costs. This seems like a win-win, right? However, while great on paper, these requirements were similar to Kennedy's announcement in the 1960s that the US would put a man on the moon before the decade ended. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was a great idea, but initially nobody really knew how to actually make it happen. Looking back on the JSF goals, they weren't just naive, they may have been the program's first major problem. These goals ended up being so complicated and ever-shifting, it became akin to assembling a million-piece jigsaw puzzle without the picture on the box. Sure, you could do it, but it would take a ton of time and you wouldn't know what you had until you were almost done. After an intense competition with Boeing, who submitted their interesting-looking X-32 design, in 2001, Lockheed Martin won with their X-35 concept. Lockheed seemed to be a great fit, having designed the world's first stealth fighter, the F-117 Nighthawk, 
as well as the world's first fifth generation fighter, the F-22 Raptor. But how could they pull all of this off? It sounds impossible, right? Well, in order to meet the needs of the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, Lockheed developed three variants of the F-35, known as the A, B, and C models. The F-35A can perhaps be considered the base model. Intended for the Air Force, it features an internal 25mm cannon along with an internal weapons bay. When Lockheed got to the Marine's B model, the stakes were raised even higher. The B variant had to perform short takeoff and vertical landing, or stovel, in the same way that the famed Harrier jump jet does. The challenge was to design a lifting system that could be tucked away to retain stealth and level flight. Enter an unlikely partnership. In 1991, as the Soviet Union was collapsing, Soviet then Russian aircraft manufacturer Yakovlev was developing their Yak-141, which was an advanced version of the apology for a fighter, the Yak-38. Seriously, the Yak-38 was outperformed in just about every category by its rival, the British Harrier. Anyway, the newer 141 model was to contain many improvements, but again, due to the fall of the Soviet Union, Yakovlev was left looking for a partner to finance the last legs of their research efforts. Enter Lockheed. In late 1991, the aerospace giant entered into a secret partnership with Yakovlev to get them to the finish line. $400 million later, three prototypes and a static test aircraft were built. Although none of these newer aircraft flew, Lockheed had what they needed to proceed with their F-35B version. The third and final version of the F-35 is of course the C model, and it is designed for catapult-assisted takeoff but arrested recovery or catobar operations what you and I would refer to as carrier ops for the Navy. The C model features larger wings, folding wings, and of course a tail hook along with a tow bar in the nose wheel that attaches to the catapult. There were many growing pains for the airframe designs and then the F-35 would face its darkest moment. Things got worse. By the early 2000s, Russia was flying and exporting their fourth generation Su-35, an advanced version of their MiG-29, while China's J-10 Vigorous Dragon was also taking to the skies. To make matters even more tense, both Russia and China were also developing their own fifth generation stealth fighters. Russia with the Su-57 Felon and China with a J-20 Mighty Dragon. Then the F-22 decision happened. In 2011, the Raptor program was canceled with just 186 of the 700 planned jets built. The political thought process at the time was that such a high-end fighter like the Raptor wasn't needed. The F-35 was now America's only new fighter program. The Lightning now had to be better than anything in the sky today and for decades to come. The stakes could not have been any higher. Under this enormous pressure, the Pentagon decided to proceed with what has become the two dirtiest words in aviation. Concurrent development. This is a process where you begin producing a new aircraft and then go back and make changes as you find issues that need to be addressed. That's like moving into your new house as it's being built. Concurrent development would go on to especially rear its ugly head in one major component that affected all three F-35 variants from day one, the code. Think of the most complicated and detailed video game you've ever played. The game's world is vast with many characters, intricate graphics, and complex physics. Now imagine if every time you played, there were glitches that made the game crash or made characters behave unpredictably. The F-35 software was like that video game, but on a much larger and crucial scale, controlling a multi-million dollar machine in real-world situations. The tiniest bug could have catastrophic consequences. Aside from stealth, one of the F-35's major advantages is sensor fusion. The ability to take information from various sensors and even other platforms and merge them into a picture that the pilot can digest and act on quickly. To do this, the F-35 software uses several million lines of code to operate. And like all software projects, the code was full of bugs and required constant rewriting. In some ways, this is an ongoing issue with the program today. Along with getting the initial code to work, the F-35 software is constantly being upgraded to accept new weapon systems, updates in avionics, and flight profiles. The latest F-35 upgrade, known as Technology Refresh 3 or TR3, improves the jet's displays, memory, and computer processing power, and is a cornerstone for the next evolutionary leap in the fighter's digital architecture, which is going to be known as Block 4. 
However, there are a couple of obstacles that are getting in the way of Block 4. The first is due to software issues with TR3, to the point that this year's F-35's deliveries will be lower than expected. The second issue has to do with the F-35's engine. It's running too hot. In order for all of the F-35's electronic systems to function properly, the engine has to provide enormous amounts of cooling capability to the electronics. Ever used a laptop for an extended period and felt it getting hotter and hotter? Electronics, especially powerful ones, generate a lot of heat. If the laptop gets too hot, it'll slow down or shut off to protect itself. Now consider the F-35's electronics, which are immensely more powerful and intricate than a laptop. Without proper cooling, these systems risk failing in mid-flight, which is far more dangerous than a laptop shutting down on your desk. The current engine, Pratt & Whitney's F-135 series, which powers all three variants, has been running over capacity and has not been able to deliver the cooling needs of TR3, let alone Block 4. There are some workarounds in place, more on that later. With all of these issues and the stakes constantly being raised for this ambitious program, we return to our initial question, is this jet worth $1.7 trillion? The reality is that the F-35 is not a concept, but rather it's a tangible aircraft. A concept can be neatly filed as right or wrong, while real aircraft are not so easily organized. Without a doubt, every generation of leap in technology has faced setbacks and delays. Some of you will remember the early days of the F-16 Fighting Falcon, when it had all kinds of issues, which led it to be referred to as the lawn dart during its development. The F-16 pioneered fly-by-wire controls, where the pilot's inputs were processed by a computer, which would then move the control surfaces accordingly. Today, virtually every fighter jet and most airlines use fly-by-wire controls and nobody worries about them. The F-16 would go on to become the most produced fourth-generation fighter in the West. Interestingly, the F-16 was and is produced by Lockheed, who of course is now making the F-35, so they've been down this road before. Tactically speaking, in modern military exercises, the Lightning routinely achieves a 20 to 1 kill ratio while performing strike and reconnaissance missions more effectively than other fighters. Pilots who have flown both 4th generation fighters and the F-35 say they would never go back to 4th gen. The F-35's sensor fusion allows the pilot to decide on what to do versus trying to operate various multifunction displays. It's like typing a research paper with a word processor versus a typewriter, which would you rather use? Then there are the numbers, they simply don't lie. With over 960 aircraft delivered, it easily outproduces most modern aircraft that are still in production, especially for a fifth generation fighter. We mentioned the F-22. While that program was cut off at 186 units produced, the goal was only ever gonna be about 700 airframes. Russia's Su-57 may have as few as five aircraft that are airworthy, and the Su-75 Checkmate that was announced two years ago, as a competitor to the F-35 by the way, is still a wooden mock-up. It's doubtful at this point if the Checkmate will ever fly, given the almost two years of sanctions imposed on Russia following their invasion of Ukraine. Meanwhile, China's J-20 Mighty Dragon is seen by many as a fourth plus and not a fifth generation fighter, and only has about 200 airframes built as of the making of this video. Then, there is the increasing number of partner nations and customers. Germany, Canada, Finland, and Switzerland have all pulled the trigger on the F-35 in the last year alone. Each of those nations held intense fighter competitions and reviewed all of their options before choosing the Lightning. Despite all the negative press and challenges, the reality is that the F-35 is no longer facing major development or production issues as it did in the early 2000s. Today, the Lightning is a game-changing fighter which can defeat any tactical aircraft in the world. And America's allies are lining up to purchase the jet. So to answer the question, is the Lightning worth $1.7 trillion? Yes, it is. Here's why. While that number seems staggering at first, consider that this is the sum of all costs for the program's operational lifetime which will run through 2070. Furthermore, when you're talking about defense spending, while $1.7 trillion is a lot of money, the US Department of Defense budget is over $800 billion this year. So $1.7 trillion is just over two years of spending for the DoD. Additionally, partner nations who produce components or purchase these fighters contribute to that amount. One last thing, the F-16 is the world's most popular fighter and still in production today. Lockheed, who as we mentioned, builds both the F-16 and F-35, 
has stated that any country with an F-16 is a potential F-35 customer, meaning we may see even more nations adopt the Lightning. However, the F-35 still is not out of the woods just yet. The engine cooling issue is a hot topic of contention right now. To better understand the challenges and the stakes, check out this video to make up your own mind if things are on track. Now you know!